if there's something urgent and I, and I need to be careful here because I don't want to put myself out on a limb, but I will. Um, if it's in a signed permit stack, well, I can pull it out and sign it right then and there and move it forward. Now, keep in mind, once we sign it at our office, it still has to go to our real estate office to be signed. So I can't speak for their workload. Usually they get them in a couple of weeks. Um, but there's still another step or two after the signed permit. We will do better, that's what I'll say, in trying to respond to the phone calls to find out status. Now, that being said, um, that just adds to the number of phone calls we have to do. So if we're trying to answer questions on, on people uh, asking about change of owners or the initial stages, and we have to make three or four return phone calls over the next three or four months replying to a status, and that's just time we're not spending actually moving the process forward. So I understand your, your needs and your wants and your desires to under, know when your permit is going to be finished and, and what the status is. But, I'll, you know, we got to balance that with managing phone calls and conversations so we can focus on the work to get it done. And I was going to go down here. To the trees. As we all know, the storms that came through. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I just was showing you where it was. It's on our webpage, on the front, down at the bottom. There's a fact sheet. And it actually gives several different scenarios of uh, if you fit into one of those scenarios, this is what you should do. The bottom line I will tell you about trees. As well, one, they're ours, so don't cut them without permission. But the second part to that is if there is a tree that's broken half off or is an imminent threat of falling and damaging property or causing injury, take pictures of it, cut it, and let us know. We don't need to wait on an imminent threat for approval. Now, then we get into the definition of imminent threat. We get many calls. Well, the tree is dying and it's leaning over my house. We go and look at it. If a tree is alive, it's going to be very hard to get permission from us to cut it because the tree is alive. So some may, people may think that's an imminent threat and we'll look at it and go, well, no, it's alive. It's perfectly fine. The tree's going to stay. Um, storm damage, you know, in the state of Georgia, if a tree is alive and a, uh, the wind or a storm knocks it down, and it, if it's a government, I, I'll just use neighbors. I'll use me and my neighbor. If I have a tree on my property that's healthy and a storm comes and it knocks it over onto my neighbor's property, well, it's up to my neighbor to clean it up or call his insurance company. Um, whether he calls my insurance company or they, whatever, I don't know. They're going to fight it out. But the acts of God and storm damage for healthy trees is going to be, for the most part, not the tree owner's responsibility. If there is notice and obvious or known decay or injury or health then that's a different story if we shouldn't if the tree was dead or otherwise showed indications of being a hazard and we didn't remove it or allow you to remove it then that's a different story but for storm damage for the most part the government's not going to be responsible um but this this little fact sheet kind of does some scenarios and hopefully we covered them. There's five, six, seven, seven scenarios in there. So hopefully you'd fit in one of them. But I, I still want to iterate if it's something imminent threat of causing damage to property or injury to a person, then make sure you document it. And let us know 
so we don't come accusing you of cutting it down the road somewhere. But you can get it gone to protect that property or protect uh, potential injury. I'm going to uh, stop right there and go for questions. So uh, we are coming up towards kind of the hour, the end of the hour, but I wanted to run through all the shoreline management questions that we have not answered. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to start at the top and just kind of work my way down. Um, if I don't ask your specific question, it may be that it's too specific and we will then follow up with you after the fact and make sure that we get the information to you that for your question. Um, so are dock permit owners allowed to rent out the usage of their docks? So for instance, for somebody to put their boat on it or let a, another family utilize the dock? The technical answer is no. It is against our regulations. Can we control and or enforce that? It's very difficult. Um, yeah, people do it. There's really no way for us to enforce it. I'll tell you the technical answer is no. You're subject to be getting caught, but probably won't. But I can't say to do it, so don't. Um, I, you might have already answered this. Um, are you giving out any more kind of single slip personal docs? Um, are you issuing any more permits? And then kind of a follow-up on that, um, somebody asked why you're not, if you aren't, doing personal dock permits, but allowing marinas to expand their docks. Okay. So twofold, issuing any more, we'll call them individual permits, uh, and, or permits for individual docks. We did reach our capacity, 10,615, as identified in our uh, shoreline management plan, EA. That was a few years ago. We do have permits available. We are, as I speak now, um, making a determination if we're going to uh, accept new permit applications this year. It's identified in our plan that we will make that announcement, I think, by March 1st. And um, we'll do so. But uh, we just discussed this the other day. And, and again, we're looking at, can we handle it with our backlog and with our staffing and, and what's the COVID going to do? Uh, we'll make a decision. I can't say yes or no at this moment. We're in, in that process. But yes, there are some permits available and we'd like to open it up. We just got to make sure we can handle it. Now, the, the uh, marina slip. So there's two different things. Our shoreline management plan is what governs individual dock permits. The marinas, and I alluded to earlier, that's going to be um, addressed in our master plan, but the marinas are governed by their own site development plans as attached to their lease. And they have a lease with approved development on that lease. And it's basically a, a contractual agreement that this is what we'll let that individual marina do. So if a marina still has um, undeveloped slips and docks on their approved site development plan, then we can't stop it. It's already been agreed to. That's what played into limiting water access of nothing new will be approved. What's already approved can be constructed whenever they choose to construct it. But it's two different authorizations. One's the shoreline management plan, and one is a real estate. Okay. Uh, tags for docks. Um, if people get new docks or their other tag is messed up, how do they get a new tag for their dock? Or call our office, call your ranger, send them an email. Um, we did hit a uh, period for a while that we didn't have any. And it, for whatever reason, our order got messed up, but we've got them now. So we should be able to get them to you. Well, I won't say get them to you. We'll go put them up. Okay. Uh, to dovetail right into that, uh, how do people find out who their area ranger is? Uh, how do they get the contact information for who they should contact? One is call the Shoreline Help Desk. Is that desk Two. staffed? I'm sorry? Is that desk staffed? Like if uh, people it call? Is. Is it so that's the good thing about telework is he can answer the phone wherever he is. Now, uh, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Um, so, uh, part of this COVID and our staffing stuff, 
I worked at help desk a few times and I'll be honest it, if I, whatever, took a 15 minute break and came back, let me back up first. I picked up the voicemails left from the previous evening, which were about 20 or so. So I started working on calling those people back, which means I wasn't answering the phone. But just getting those calls returned, if we're not doing that nonstop, it, it just builds up and adds up. But we, we just can't get to them. And I've got a notebook full here of I couldn't tell you how many voicemails that I'd go through and listen and write down, and I'd start going down and call them back. And it took me days, if not weeks, to go through that to get them called back. So email is good, and that's what I was about to bring up. And and Jennifer, I'll share that with you. I'm going to mention it, especially Lanier Shoreline, all one word, at uh, usace.army.mil. Where did, there it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I looked at the wrong thing. We do want to get our areas, our area map with our rangers on the website. We learned a lesson previously, though. We're not going to put names with the area rangers because they change. Um. And part of our issue before, when I mentioned we got up to staff for about a month, we had just moved to six areas. And then three people left, so we had to go back to four. So right now our map is showing four areas. We intend to go back to six. So the flux there, we got to have you just call the help desk now because that's changing very frequently and will over the next few months, actually even as we get some more people hired. Um, so yeah, so Lakeland. Sorry. And I'll get you this later, though. Lake Lanier Shoreline at usace.army.mil. I'll get you that. That's who they can send to find out their area ranger. Okay. Uh, if somebody leaves, if a ranger leaves and we, someone sends an email to their personal email that's not the generic one, are those emails going someplace or are they just, are they still being monitored? If it goes to timothy.a.rainy at usace.army.mil, it's not, it's going to go to computer cyber land. Okay. If it goes to Lanier SLM dash area one, then the next person handling on that area will get it. Okay. And that's why we want to use those generic shoreline area emails. Okay. Um, in terms of, I don't want to get too specific, but um, in terms of say invasive species that are on core shoreline, are people allowed to remove those without getting a permit, uproot them? What's yeah, we still we still want to give you a permit because we need to, you know, I come out there and I see stuff's been cleared out. The first thing I'm going to do is say, why are you clearing government property? Because I don't know what was there. So, But, yes, you can do it. We just need to give you a specified X permit. And that's, again, just a phone call. A ranger may have to go over look and see what it is. And I would, depending, define the area you need to remove and the, and the methods. Uh, but we need do need to have, uh, issue a permit. Um, if you want to change their dock size or change what's in their permit um, for their dock, is that, how do they go about doing that? Do they contact their area ranger and start that conversation? Contact the office, start that conversation. It's called a modification to a permit. Um, bottom line, in our system, it will be treated as a new permit. There may or may not be additional fees. It depends on the type modification it needs to be. Um, so keep in mind if it's dock size, if you have an 18 by 24 dock and want to go to a something smaller or the same, well, if it's the same, you don't have to modify. If you want to go bigger, we, we do have to come out and inspect to make sure there's room for it. So that will take a little bit long because we have to come out and inspect for it. If you just want to add an electric line or a water line, um, well, we may still have to come out and see where it's going to run. Uh, but yeah, bottom line is to call the help desk or your area ranger. If you don't know who the area ranger, the generic email to the help desk is like Lanier Shoreline at usa.stoutarmy.mil. Um, 
I so I receive questions about this often and have conversations um, about kind of consistency when somebody gets a new ranger it was something that was either previously permitted or, or allowed and now that they have a new ranger it's no longer allowed. Is there any thoughts on the consistency in, in terms of um, implementing the manual? And Lots of thought about it. Lots of discussion about it. They, they need to be telling you what's in the plan. Uh, the problem is we just get overwhelmed with stuff. And, and I'll be honest, and it's something I need to mention, and I'm, I may get out ahead of myself because I got out ahead of myself last year, but we were supposed to start the process to update our plan this year. We didn't get the funding, so we're not doing it. Um, I raised Kane about it. They've promised we'd get the money next year. There is a lot in our plan that I want to change. There's a lot of stuff in there that we restrict that I want to get rid of because um, I, I don't want our rangers chasing all these things. And, and I want them to reduce the time they're doing inspections and reduce exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, what a birdhouse. Plan says you can't have a birdhouse on government property. Well, you know, the new young new rangers going to come in there and say, nope, got to get rid of your birdhouse. Where the old guy who was there was like, yeah, he's had that birdhouse for 30 years. It's not hurt anything. We're not going to do anything about it. How do you deal with that? You know, the new ranger's right. You shouldn't have it. So that, yeah, that gives a, a bad image that we're not being consistent. And we're not being consistent. So we got to work on our staff to get it. They need to uh, identify deficiencies that are uh, restrictions in the plan. Um, but hopefully going forward, and again, this will be a couple of years out, but we can we can get some of this stuff addressed in our new shoreline management plan where it helps the situation. For the time being, if one if if I've just let you have it for the last twenty years and we say you got to get rid of it, well, the plan says you got to get rid of it unless you've got something in writing that says we allowed you to keep it. The ranger's opinion out there looking or not look or not doing anything about it's not really going to justify something being left. So if something was permitted from a previous person, say a golf cart path or something along those lines, and then now a new owner comes in, I've heard a lot that the new owner has to remove what was previously permitted. Uh, is that correct? So a couple different scenarios here. If it's a golf cart path, since you mentioned it, you'll you'll the, the new person will have to give uh, proof of proof of uh, medical need. If they can't give that proof of medical need, then yeah, they'll have to remove it. Um, the, the golf cart pass are only authorized for physical assistance or, or a need for, and I'm, I'm deliberately trying not to use the word disability, uh, a medical need. Um, other things, if things are grandfathered, as long as they're kept in uh, serviceable condition, then they can continue to be grandfathered. Um, I'll, I'll use an example of a of mowing. Somebody has a mowing permit and moves and puts their house on the market and and you know sells it with a mowing permit. Well, if they hadn't been there and mowed the yard in three years and there's woody vegetation growing, naturally restored area, then we're not going to allow the mowing to continue. So there's an example of grandfathered action not being allowed when someone else comes in. Um, some people, a lot of people, not as many now, but just have houses as second houses. And for whatever reason, they may live in California or whatever, and they may not be at their house for six or eight years. Oh, we got a mowing permit. It's like, well, there's trees growing now. No, you're not going to mow it. The mowing permit is void. Well, it's grandfathered. If you got to keep it in the condition, you got to keep maintaining what your your permitted uh, uh, action was for. Uh, how do you do? Speaking of living far away, how do you do a change of address for mail correspondence? People have a change yeah. of address for any reason. Send it to our help desk or call, because all we do is we can just go into the computer and put in the new address hit the button and send you another package. Um, the great uh, big yellow signs on people's property. What are those and what do they mean? And what uh, do they have to do? 
The big yellow signs most likely are for what we call timber trespasses. It's been unauthorized clearing. Um, I think for the most part, they speak to that. The area, they have to work with us to restore the land. If you've gone out and, and cut trees uh, illegally, then you could be fined. Um, it can get rather expensive. and You have to restore the land. So we'll, we'll identify it, saying this area needs to be restored. Um, and it's, it's really just a more identification purposes that this land has been impacted and it needs to be restored. Um, no wake zones. Uh, I hear um, are, are a hot topic a lot. How do people, if they're having problems, if they feel like their cove is small um, and they're having problems with um, boaters and docks and that sort of thing, how can people get a no wake zone? Is that even something that people can get or moving a ski, no ski zone to a no wake zone? So navigation markers, regulatory markers on the lake or a joint effort, I'll say, between the state of Georgia, the DNR, and us. Uh, the bottom line is we'll place the markers and we'll maintain the markers, uh, but we both have to agree a marker is necessary, and that part goes to the state. And they have conditions that they look at. Um, and when requests come in either to us or to the state, we both sit down together and figure out if a marker needs to be in that location. And 99 times out of 100 that when it comes in, it, it's not needed or it doesn't meet the criteria, so it's denied. I don't know. I think the last time we approved something was the just the, the no wake buoys at, I can't remember which bridge. We put the no wake buoys out temporarily for the construction, and afterwards, whomever requested they stay, and we got with DNR and both agreed they could stay. But backs of coves and, and uh, narrow channels, as long as there's room to navigate, for the most part, uh, no way uh, buoys will be denied. Um, if somebody is disabled uh, or has an issue, I'm reading it off a question. Um, okay. How? What is the process for trying to have any um, access granted, any golf cart pass or anything oh. to help them get down to the lake? What is that process for somebody to go through? Yeah, uh, just call your area ranger and <clears throat> excuse me, get a, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact terms, the statement of medical necessity from your doctor, or even just mail that in, and we'll look at it. Um, now, for golf carts, I do need to mention there's a certain slope, and I don't want to say a slope but there's a certain slope we won't even allow a golf cart path on even if it's a medical necessity because it's too steep for a golf cart path um, but your area ranger or the help desk can help you with that and the process is if it's all if the slope's good and you have the medical necessity it's it's pretty simple you send it in we go in the database and can just check the box and um, well i shouldn't say it's that simple if it's a golf cart path, we'll have to go out and look to make sure where it can go. Because um, right now we don't, uh, you know, the plan doesn't even allow handrails or benches or anything like that on government property. Sometimes that's simple enough if they give a statement of medical necessity and they just need a handrail. A lot of times we can just do that pretty quickly. Um. Do you have those? Do you have those emails on the website of how people can contact Shoreline? The email you've been saying. No, they're not. That's what I have to work with you on, and I, we plan to get them there, but we want to wait. Well, I, I'll ask. Um, you know, we're we're back at our four areas, and we're moving to six. So, do we update the website now with four areas and four emails, and then it changes in two months, or do we wait and do it? then um right now we've decided just to <clears throat> excuse me um contact the lake lanier shoreline email because even if we go to six we still have three rangers quote unquote in training we can assign them an area but they're still going to have to go with someone else while they're 
in training. So we're, we're still, to be honest with you, figuring it out. So in the meantime, call the help desk and we'll get you to the right person. So we do have some other questions in the queue, but we're already close to 20 minutes over kind of our hour. Some of them um, are specific and we will get back to you with those answers. We are, we also had a question, is this going to be available? So half of it will be available on Facebook. I didn't press record until we were about halfway through <laughs> at the shoreline uh, part. So ideally we wanted it all to be on, um, on our Facebook, but it's not going to be. Way to go technology and human error. So half of it will be available to be able to view later, the shoreline management half. And like I said, we'll try to get out some of those questions and answers. And probably what we'll do along with it is create a question and answer sheet. I know that Tim, you were great and you answered some questions for us before the webinar for people with questions. So if you email me questions and I didn't get to them, I do have those um, and um, I will get those answers out to you. Always people can reach out to me if they have other questions and I can get them to Tim, uh, my email is jflowers at lakelinear.org or you can call our office 770-503-7757 um, and we're happy to kind of facilitate that um, conversation. And so John's gonna wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Tim. Uh, very informative, very helpful. And I hope everybody uh, got something out of today's session. Uh, just a couple of points here. We had over um, 86 questions submitted and we tried to get to many of them and I know we didn't get to all of them, but rest assured we've got the questions, we know the concerns and we will try to get feedback back to you to uh, ensure that you got answers to your questions or you know where to go to get answers to your questions. I would have to say this, uh, the relationship between the Lake Lanier Association and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Tim's team at Buford Dam has never been better. Uh, we collaborate on a variety of on-water initiatives. Uh, we talked about the abandoned duck and uh, derelict boat program that we've had going now for the last five or six years and the success we've had there but the hazard marker solar lights, uh, the rip rep project on islands. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, activities that we have collaborated on and worked together and I think improved everybody's um, use and utilization of, of Lake Lanier. And I think that's a tribute to Tim and his staff for being receptive to us and including us in their planning process and in their dialogue about what uh, what's good and, and needs to be done around the lake. So uh, kudos to the Corps of Engineers, kudos to Jennifer and the team for putting this webinar together. We are committed to doing more of these. We've got a webinar, the next webinar we've got scheduled is will be in March and we'll deal with how to maintain your uh, grounds, uh, your lawn care, and the use of fertilizer in and around the lake and the impact that that can have on water quality. But in addition to that, we're going to continue our webinar process throughout the year. And Tim has agreed to come back and join us on a frequent basis, uh, perhaps as much as semi-annually, if we can make that happen, to, to do this. I mean, you can see 86 questions. You know, we, we, we got to a lot of them, but we didn't get to all of them. And uh, I think by increasing the frequency and increasing our interaction with Tim and his team, uh, we will all be uh, in a much better spot. So uh, thanks again. Thanks again for participating. Thanks to you, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate your honesty and candor in, in these conversations, and uh, we look forward to more of that in the future. Thank you, John, and thank you all to who, are particip to who participated. Again. Thank you very much.